Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. Monsignor Essif is a priest of the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Teresa of Calcutta. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Monsignor Essif encountered St. Padre Pio, who would become a spiritual father to him. He has lived in areas around the world, serving in the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by Pope St. John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially to the poor. He continues to serve as a retreat leader and director to bishops, priests, and sisters, seminarians, and other religious leaders. Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. What's on your heart today, Monsignor? The, the commandment that God gives, Chris, is absolutely impossible to fulfill. The Pharisees are asking our Lord the two greatest commandments, and actually no one can fulfill this, this command except Jesus, with him and through him and in him. And the teaching today is really powerful. This is a, a teaching from Matthew's Gospel. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments the gospel of the Lord. Who can do that? When God tells me, I command you to love me with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, I say, well, God, I can't do that. Every human being, because of our weakness and our tendencies towards self-centeredness, has never been able to fulfill that. All down through the ages, the story of mankind is failure, failure, failure. The Jews in their history, unfolding the 45 books of the scriptures and in all other reading and all other matters, who has loved God with her whole heart, whole soul, whole mind? Only Jesus he is the Son of God who became a human like us. What God is saying to us today is only I, Jesus, in you. You need me to fulfill this law. When you are going to love God, it is I in you and you in me. Every Catholic, every Protestant, Every Orthodox should hear this even before you begin to, to either kneel down or turn your eyes toward God or look up to pray. It is the one in you, Christ, who is already God-centered. I have never left the side of my Father. The Holy Spirit, who has been poured into you, through water and the baptism, is already in you. Yesterday, I was with a man whom I have, have exorcised, and he's learning now to pray. 
as I was with him, just teaching him again, the presence of Jesus within him, the beauty of who he is. It was so magnificent to begin to teach him that there is a power in him that can praise God and glorify God and honor God. And that person in him, and as he and I were praying and and being together, that you have a power in you to glorify, honor, and praise God. Paul reminds us in his first letter to the Thessalonians in the first chapter, verses 5 to 10. Brothers and sisters, you know what sort of people we were among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model for all believers. Paul comes among them, and he teaches the Thessalonians, and you become imitators of me as I have of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that you became models for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only to Macedonia and Achaia, but to every place your faith in God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything further. For they themselves openly declare about us what sort of reputation and reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind. The Thessalonians are doing this, and to await his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivered us from the coming wrath. Christ in the Thessalonians, Christ in those who have learned this. I think one of the most important ways to try and achieve this Jesus awareness of who I am is for husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and families to enthrone the sacred heart in their home. Bringing the family together, recognizing Jesus, you are our way. You are the truth. You are our life. You have become the king of my heart, father, mother, children. And then we place you as the head of this home. And from now on, you reign over all the things that go on here. So what is happening in that home 24-7? Love the Lord, your God, with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength, and love your neighbor, one another, as yourself. My niece, she called me the other day. She has three children. Andy is, uh, Andrea is three, and she has twins. And her, her husband and herself, we had the enthronement of the Sacred Heart in their home, and we also had, I had the baptism of their children. And we were talking at 7.30 in the morning in that, in that house, when they wake up, well, they're not asking you how you feel, Mom. They're demanding. They need attention. And everybody's scurrying around. And recently, Brian, her husband, broke his foot. What is the love of God? The whole heart, the whole soul, the whole mind. You think that's what they're doing in that house in the morning? No, they're taking care of one another. But the deepest sense that that they can have as a family is to know that it is Christ in them. Christ in them, loving one another seeing one husband and wife, seeing Jesus in those babies, in their needs and their care that they have, that that doesn't become a bedlam. That becomes a harmony. Love God. Love your neighbor. A God-centered home with the cries and the needs that are there. And they're all crying out, 
the babies are crying. Each one of them has needs. Oh, God, please help me. And so when I was listening to her, I was thinking, you know, some of us think we're so busy. And then I, I think of a, a, another couple that I know, husband and wife, really wanting to discern what is God's will for them, taking time to pray, taking time to get direction, having three children that have special needs, job needs, difficulties with regard to income sometimes, financial relationships, all of those things, but such a deep awareness in that couple, so so needy. When you have needs, as the these two families, there is a constant cry to God. What brings us to the Father? Love the Lord your God with your whole heart. Need. Crying out. Babies cry out. People cry out. The more needy I am, the weaker I am, the more I cry out to God, my Father. And so Jesus within us is always centered on the Father so that into those people who are aware that he is the one who supplies all the strength, all the love in this family, in this individual, has such strong needs, then they cry out to him. In the Mass, too, it's the church is pointing out that same thing with regard to need. And so they t- we, we turn in the, in the Mass to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, the church is saying to us, if God is to be the center of all things, then God especially hears the cry of the poor. What do, what do we learn here? That only Jesus is the one within us who can cry out to the Father. Only Jesus who takes upon himself all the needs of all the people of all time. He is the center of the whole universe so that when we are united with him, we can become united with God and united with one another. The rich Jews, as well as you rich Christians, sometimes fail to experience strong need. When you're comfortable, when you're fat, when you have all this kind of moral control, when you come to a position where you have such power, you think the power is in you. This is a story of rich Jews, but it also applies very much to the rich of our time. That is those who think they are in control. Thus says the Lord, you shall not molest or oppress an alien, for you were once all aliens yourselves in the land. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. If ever you wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will come, will flare up and I will kill you with the sword. Then you and your own wife will be a widow and your children orphaned. God is severe when we are oppressing others. If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act like an extortioner toward him by demanding interest from him. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you shall return it to him before sunset. For this cloak of his is the only covering he has to cover his body. What else has he to sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. Who are the most needy among us? 
those in whom Jesus dwells in need, in need, the alien, the poor, those who are crying out. How many people I've seen who led very comfortable lives and then because of circumstances, maybe death, maybe the economy lost their home and now became quite impoverished. When you experience that, that deep need as a human, that then it's when we realize our dependence on God. God in his love, as you, you're just sitting there in the pew, driving your car this Sunday morning, however, do you have a deep wound? Are you suffering in some way or other? That intensity with which you have a need, a concern, a care, the depth to which that is in you, that's the depth of which Christ is in you in your weakness. The devil loves our strength. The devil loves our riches and our power. You've got it. You've made it. But God loves our weakness. And God loves our need. That's the one he responds to. That's really the closest you'll come to Christ in your heart on an emotional and feeling level. Out of that, as you cry, that's the cry that unites you with the Father. That's the cry of Jesus within you. How do I know who Christ is within me when I come to know my powerlessness? There was one who became powerless. He was the Son of God. And he came down to us and took on our flesh. He suffered, he died, he rose. He went back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit into all our hearts. Everyone who is listening to me who has been baptized by water and the Holy Spirit has this Jesus within him or within her. That parish that has a pastor who has this awareness. You mentioned this to somebody, a modern Thessalonica. Oh yeah, there's a priest. He's really aware of who he is. Who is he? That's Jesus in that parish. The pastor is Jesus. Who is he as in, in that family, that father, that mother? That's Jesus. All, all that we have in love comes from him. He has been poured forth into our hearts. Children, when you experience this love, and when you experience this cry in you, that's Jesus crying out to the Father, love the Lord, your God, with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole strength, and your whole mind. Where is Jesus in Omaha? Where is he in Scranton? Once he showed up in ours and the power that happened in him, just like in Thessalonica, the power that happened with John Vianney's heart, Jesus spread like wildfire throughout all of France. They came and they wanted to hang. He was hardly able to speak. He really wasn't that intelligent. He almost didn't make it through the seminary, but he was aware of who he was. They wanted to go and confess their sins to him. He set the world on fire. If you're a priest and you know who you are, it's him in you. He in you wants to live. He in you can set the world on fire. John Vianney was Jesus. You have been so configured to Jesus that you're in persona Christi. 
But if you're smug and strong and you stand in the pulpit and you sound out your own words, your flock will never really hear Jesus because they hear you. What's the difference? The Spirit knows and you know and the world knows. They really do. That, you see, the Pharisee is a phony. That's the one who came to him. They, this teacher and a scholar knew the law. You can stand in the pulpit and know. The, use the same words. But the interior action. Pharisee is a phony. Pharisee is a hypocrite. Pharisee wears a mask. The interiority of the union that you have in your heart. Love the Lord with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with your whole strength. And then this happens. You surrender to him who makes the breakthrough. And then he, through you, and with you and in you, the world will change. Family by family, parish by parish, country by country, all the world will know because they know him and he came to save us. It can be quite a challenge for those who are listening, Monsignor, and desire to respond in the way that you're putting before us. I mean, to be Jesus, you have to let go of the idea, essentially, that it's something that you can do. And that's a hard paradigm for some, that it's more about surrendering yourself and allowing him in responding in virtue. I mean, you can kind of tell when you're doing it with virtue as opposed to something that I'm controlling. Am I making sense? Very much right on. In fact, when you use the word, because when you do the interior exam with these words, because that's what our Lord is talking to, these these Pharisees, they knew the words, but they didn't do the interior work. And so the surrender was within themselves. It wasn't what they could do. That's really what they wanted. Teach us what we can do. And they kept extending these two laws to get 620 some laws uh, for the, you know, they, they wanted to do what God wanted, but I want to do it. So I get down to washing the cups and washing hands and this and this and this. And so it's all exterior. And, and so the exteriority is where they were stuck. And many of us are also, we're stuck on the, in, in the externa, externality. But how to break through that and get into the heart is what Jesus was trying to do with this, uh, with this Pharisee that came to see him. And he's trying, and many of us, you know, you, you're in your diocese. How often does the coming of the bishop really mean the coming of Christ? And I, I know a lot of parishes. Oh, here comes the bishop. No, here comes Jesus. And people know the difference. So who is it that you're, you're, you're bringing to your, to your diocese? Who is it? Are you aware, dear bishop, archbishop, cardinal, are you aware that it's not you? It's not all about you. It's about him. He is the only savior of the world. And so many times when you get lifted up and you have all these perks of clothing and wrapping and so on, you can easily fall into being a phony. It's one of those things where we feel, and I, I know I've done that myself, that, but I'm a good person. I do good things. But the word is, I do good. And it's it's not necessarily about being good per se as it is to be Christ in the world. That's why I picked the example of my niece, Michelle, and her husband, Brian, with those three little babies. <clears throat> if you have all this screaming and going on, <laughs> you're pretty much sure you're not in control and that you have to mm -hmm. cry out, oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, I wonder how many times a day they say, oh, my God, help me. 
So that uh -huh. that cry is easy, and and that's what the 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 uh, Exodus passage is about. Oh my God, help me! God, help me! When you're spending your day crying out, God, help me! Help me, God! And and He's right there, and and the one who cries is Jesus, and the one who answers is the Father, and that goes on all over the world. And in places where we we don't re and sometimes it's not really a lot of religious places. I know this priest is very comfortable, has tons of money, and is always looking at the stock exchange and how much he has in fact comfortable as could be. What kind of cry is he going to have? He's so everything is so pleasant and kind, and so in, in this world you could be very comfortable, and when you're comfortable, you don't feel the cry. And you don't feel the need. And that's the kind of danger that's there. When I am really comfortable and wealthy and I just don't hear the cry of the poor. And I don't feel it myself. I am filled with all kinds of contentment, which is very temporary. Because as we know, passage after passage that Jesus teaches us, it's very temporary and very passing. Thank you so much, Monsignor. God bless. You've been listening to Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer rock-solid and authentic spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com. And join us next time for Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essef.